Greetings gamers, my name's Anto. Today I want to talk to you about the book of many things and whether or not it lives up to my hype. This video is sponsored by Chepaku, makers of incredible battle maps. More on them later. So I know that this is like five, six months later than it should be, but it's not my fault that the billion dollar company that makes most of their money making cards doesn't know how to make cards properly. And that's just the start of the complicated feelings I have about this book that have nothing to do with its content. So we're going to kind of start off by separating that off and I'm going to give a little bit of a caveat that's separate to the content of the book in the, in the timeline of me finding out that this book was going to be a thing, finding out what it was, starting to get excited, deciding, yeah, Maybe I'll pre-order it and see whether it lives up to the hype or not. And then it getting delayed and there being 8 million controversies with Wizards of the Coast in between the time that I'd paid money for this goddamn thing and it arriving. And now it arriving, my feelings towards the whole thing have changed a little bit and I'm going to try and disregard a lot of those when I talk about the actual content of the book but it's difficult in this landscape of being a TTRPG creator to talk about a wizard's product and not talk about wizards because they keep setting themselves on goddamn fire but if I want to write off this book as a business expense and you know not just have wasted my money then I need to make this video so you get in a video on the book of many things I've got a bunch of notes on this that I'm going to reference throughout and let's just dive into it. So when this book was announced, it sounded like exactly the kind of book that I've wanted from 5th edition for a long time. A book that seemed like it was made for Dungeon Masters. The last book that we got in this vein was Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which was in 2020. Now, God, that feels like a long time ago. I had a lot of problems with Tasha's Cauldron at the time. I thought it was pretty underwhelming in what it offered, and I thought that it was too much player content versus DM-focused content. I wanted a book of DM material, something to inspire me, and something that contained a good smorgasbord of the everything title that they seem to have established with Xanathar's and Tasha's, and I just didn't seem to get it. So when I heard about the Book of Many Things, I started to get really excited when I watched some of the interviews with the writers and heard them talk about what was going to be in it. I got more excited, and it got to the point where I thought, this might be the book that I've been waiting for for 5th edition pretty much since I started playing 5th edition. So I decided that I would go ahead and pre-order it. The cards looked like they were going to be gorgeous. And it seemed like as an overall package, it was going to be pretty attractive. Like two weeks after I pre-ordered it, they were like, yeah, we're going to delay production because we don't know how to make cards properly and don't know how to do this, apparently. And then there was just 8 million other controversies between then and now and... Like I said, in this video, 2023 was a lot, but months removed after that, we're in 2024, we're, we're taking a fresh slate, we're focusing on just playing the game and trying to enjoy ourselves as much as possible, and the package finally arrived at my door, and I started digging into it, and very quickly, I realised that this actually is, for the most part, the book that I was hoping it would be. So I'm just going to pull up my notes, um, we're going to kind of talk through some of the things that I thought and have opinions on as I was going through this book. So if you weren't aware, the book is laid out in chapters that are dedicated to the major arcana of the deck of many things. So that 22 card set, 22 chapters, I think it is, each of them dedicated to a different card among the deck of many things, and each chapter has a different focus. I love that in theory, but what actually ends up happening is that it means that navigating the book is a hot mess. So there are monsters included in this book, as an example, and they are spread out all throughout the book. And if you go to the table that summarizes the monsters, instead of giving you the page references for them, it gives you the chapter references. So you still have to go flicking through to the chapter and then page by page to find the monsters. Same with magic items. In the magic items section, it gives you a table giving you all of the magic items that can be found throughout the book, but lists them by chapter and not by page. So finding them is a real pain in the ass. I appreciate what they were trying to do here. They wanted to keep 
like for like things they want monsters that are relevant to specific chapters in their own chapters rather than spinning them all out into a separate chapter which is what i think they should have done and then just reference the stat block elsewhere but by not giving page references where they make these tables it makes the tables pointless it makes navigating the book much harder than it needs to be and it does make me question did the person that do the layout and the the technical presentation for this book not stop and think oh, th this rules manual this reference material for people playing this game might actually need page numbers it's just it's, it's something that really really irks me similarly after spending so long with Pathfinder second edition books and my own books I really miss having a bookmark ribbon it's a really little thing and I know you can get just regular bookmarks but God, it's just such a nice quality of life thing to just be able to be like oh I'm going to mark this particular page or this particular chapter with the ribbon. It's really nitpicky, but it does go towards the, the kind of premium feel of the books. And these things have recently got a price rise, which I don't think is unjustified. I do think in general, TTRPG books are under-costed for the amount of work that they take and the amount of value that you can get out of them. But it would be really nice to get a bookmark ribbon. I know how much these things cost. I do it in my own books. And if I can do it with the tiny numbers that I'm producing versus WotC, there, there's no reason they can't do it. As I started diving into the book, I noticed something that has really started to annoy me about fifth edition books, where they seem to have this look how much history we have problem. So in the opening chapter, before telling you what the deck of many things is, the book gives you its publication history. And if you're a game master who just wants to run the game, the publication history of this thing doesn't mean anything to you. This deep history of D&D's publication and the, the long-standing way in which the deck has appeared through all of the different editions, that's worthless to a dungeon master that just wants to get it on the table and in front of their players. Having that extra historical context is nice for some people, but I felt like as soon as I opened the book, I don't want to be reading about the publication history of the deck of many things. I want to be straight into tell me what this thing is, how it works, and why it's cool. I don't care about how it's appeared in various other editions that I've either never played or potentially never heard of if you're brand new to D&D and don't know any of its history. But there are products for people who want to learn about the history of D&D. There's the Art and Arcana book, which I've got back here somewhere. There's going to be a making of D&D book coming out later this year. I don't need a, hey, look how long we've been around in so many of the books. I also think that a lot of people are probably going to be quite frustrated getting a concrete introduction to the origins of the deck of many things it doesn't bother me wildly because i largely just ignore the forgotten realms and all of its canon anyway but it seems odd to give such an enigmatic item a defined origin but on the other hand it is nice for brand new dungeon masters to at least have an option to know where this thing came from and to be able to choose to ignore that. So on the one hand, I'm like, the the, the sort of semi grognard in me is like, why does it, why does everything need explaining? But then the other part of me is like, actually giving options to new Dungeon Masters is quite nice. Th this point started as having a point, but as I've gone along has lost the ability to have a point. And it's now more just an observation that there exists an origin for the deck in this book take of that what you will. Before I go into a lot of the stuff I did like, there's one other thing that I disliked about this book, and as per usual, if you've watched any of my 5e content, this won't be a surprise, it's the monsters. The, the CR system in 5e is still a hot mess. I hope that they're going to fix this with the 2024 revision, but seeing how close we are to that publication, and seeing how off the numbers of the creatures in this book are, I am not hopeful at all. You want to be very, very careful with the monsters that are presented in here because it is possible for them to punch way above their CR rating would suggest. For example, the Ambitious Assassin. It explicitly recommends that for levels one through four, but that particular creature could quite easily kill a level four fighter in one turn between their regular attacks and their legendary actions. Now, it is nice to see them making more monsters with interesting abilities and doing more interesting things and making more full use of the action economy, but they need to be mindful of how that impacts the CR because 
when you're saying, hey, look, a level one party can encounter this thing, that creature would absolutely massacre a level one party. Anything with legendary actions is going to decimate a level one party because of the way that they get to interact with the action economy. They get way more attacks than the dungeon master might at first get realize or the players might anticipate and you can very easily find yourselves in a situation where your party are all dead and dying and you're like how did i end up here the book told me that this was okay so that's something that really bothers me still about fifth edition hopefully it will be magically fixed by the time they roll out the changes to the rule set later this year and early next year but again i don't hold my breath now, I love tools that can help me save time when I'm preparing for a session of D&D or any other TTRPG, which is why I'm really glad that today's video is sponsored by Che Peku Maps. If you're looking for high-quality fantasy maps for your next D&D or Pathfinder campaign, Che Peku has you covered. Get your hands on more than 4,000 stunning hand-drawn fantasy maps and D&D battle maps that will take your tabletop role-playing games to the next level. They've got a wide variety of options and they are my go-to to start in place whenever I need a map for my game session I head over to the Che Peku website load up their map search for some key terms and see what they've got available many of the maps have multiple different variations for day or night different weather different environmental effects or different layouts within the maps themselves so there's plenty of options for you to choose from depending on what you need for your specific scene and they've even got a number of maps that completely change environmentally so you can have a multi-staged battle which makes it even more epic if you want to add even more immersions for your maps the higher tier also include animated versions of the maps which are great for virtual tabletop play to add a little bit of movement and interest to the map to make it fully come to life for your players. I'll leave a link down to Che Peku down in the description below and thanks again to them for supporting the channel and sponsoring this video. So with my usual 5e based rants out of the way a lot of the problems with this book are just systemic to the system. Let's talk about the cool stuff in this book. I went into this wanting something to inspire me as a game master. I didn't expect to go into it knowing that I would use 100% of the material in it. I didn't expect to go in and go right I'm going to take everything exactly as it's presented but I did with the very nature of the deck of many things expect to be inspired and it really really delivers on that. I was barely 10 pages in before I started getting distracted by thoughts of how I could use the material I was reading about in the book in my own game and that's exactly what I want from a book like this. I also loved the way that they added new mechanics and new ways to interact with the deck of many things into this book. Now the deck of many things is notorious for being a campaign killer. It can completely demolish your campaign if you deploy it and the players just start pulling cards and it's pretty renowned for decimating many a campaign. So this book goes out of its way to give you a lot of options for introducing the deck in more controlled ways. So it gives you options for how to select certain cards, certain subsets of cards to fit specific gameplay styles. It tells you which cards to include or which cards to omit depending on which vibe you're going for in your game. And I really love that. It also gives you unique effects for each card that aren't tied to the, the drawing of the card from the deck itself. So kind of a, oh, if you have this card on your person, you get this effect in addition to and separate from pulling it as an action from the deck of many things. And I really like that because it gives you as the GM more options to introduce this item, have your players interact with this cornerstone of D&D mythology without just completely demolishing your campaign in the process. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the spice of the deck of many things. It's one of the biggest draws for me. And... I've used it in previous campaigns and I've just introduced it into my current campaign based in large part on a lot of the inspiration and influences from reading this book. And for me, the spice of, oh, am I going to pull something incredible or am I going to be sent to an extra play in a dungeon for the rest of eternity? That's a huge part of it. But I get that that's not everyone's cup of tea and given more options for people to interact with this item without having to be forced into that all or nothing mindset, 
I'm a big fan of. I also really like a lot of the lore and mythology that gets added to the deck of many things from this book or kind of bought in and updated through this book. So the idea that someone who creates a card for the deck of many things becomes immortal and then joins this kind of council of card creators who get together and kind of oversee cosmic politics is really really cool. I love the idea of a character who's motivated by the idea of I want to create a new card for the deck of many things and all the way along their character arc all of their party members believe that they are doing it because they just like weird esoteric magic shit and actually they're doing it because the deck of many things killed my family and I want to infiltrate the cabal of people who know about this and create all of these cards and I want revenge and that's just a really cool story concept to me. I also think the book does a pretty decent job of providing tools and options for Dungeon Masters. The puzzle section introduces a variety of new puzzles, but I like that it does so with a lot of guidance on here are how to give hints for these puzzles, here are some solutions to these puzzles, and it's much more of a GM-focused presentation of here is the puzzle, and then here's your guidance for how to run this puzzle, versus just here is the puzzle, here is the answer, you'll figure everything else out yourself. The magic items included in this book are also just way more interesting than most of the magic items we've gotten up until this point in 5th edition. There's a lot of really cool options included within the magic items included in this book. A lot of them have two or three different separate abilities that will trigger based on certain things, and they are just much more interesting as opposed to you get plus one to your attack and damage. But this really does highlight the problem with magic item economy in 5e in particular. Now, the 5e PHB and several of the 5e books really kind of go out of the way to say, look, magic is supposed to be rare in this world. You're not supposed to be able to go into a shop and buy magic items. Fair enough. That's not how 90% of their customers are interacting with this product. Most people have magic item shops and most campaigns expect for you to be able to go and buy magic items. So the fact that they don't provide any guidance for what sort of level is this magic item appropriate for outside of the table in Xanathar's, which gives some broad guidance, but it's not great, and it's really only applicable to the magic items in that book because it contextualizes them by items in this table are appropriate for levels one through five. But then if your item isn't in one of these tables, you have to guess as to where it would fit in. And that's one of my big problems with 5e is that not having prices and level suggestions for all of these items, just is, it's just making work for the Dungeon Master. I want to go and buy a book where someone else has done that work for me. If this is a problem that you are suffering from, I do recommend checking out the table in Chapter 2 of Xanathar's Guide. It's the best we get in an official capacity for 5th edition. There are several third-party options, like the table of sane magic items, I think it's called, that try and add pricing to them, but because no one in the third-party space has got a look behind the hood of how wizards are making their items, it's I just want an official thing, you know? The real star of the magic item show in this book, though, are the deck of many things, obviously, but then the deck of many more things. So this book goes out of its way to introduce a lot of new cards into the deck of many things mythos for you to be able to play around with. And a lot of these deck of many more things options outside of the kind of major arcana tarot cards that you get in the traditional 22 deck version of the deck of many things are much lower in power and much less cataclysmic in their stakes to both player and world and I really really like them. There's a bunch of different decks presented throughout the book all of which have different abilities and different effects that are all really cool and well worth checking out to inspire your game or to cut into the deck of many things to change how it balances to be more positive towards the players, more negative towards the players, change that up. And there's a lot of guidance in the book on how to do this, which is great. I think probably my favorite new card is the corpse card, which just immediately puts you into death saves. I love how on the nodes that is. You pull a card, it says corpse, and you just become a corpse. And 
That's the kind of nonsense shenanigans I love about the deck of many things. Putting you into death saves means you're probably going to survive it because one of your friends is probably going to stabilise you. But it gives you a glimpse into the chaos that you can get from the deck of many things. That said, a couple of the cards, dollars. The ooze card, just spawning an ooze. It's funny. Like, it absorbs the person that has drawn it. They just kind of are immediately like inside the news in the moment that'd be funny once but what a waste of a card man the corpse card is the same corpse turns you into a corpse it's very on the nose but too many of those on the nose things and players just start expecting the exact thing to happen that they draw and that runs kind of counter to the tarot nature of the deck of many things some of my other favorite elements of the book are the new factions that get introduced the solar bastion these people that kind of travel the cosmos trying to protect people against the influence of the cards the grim hollow these victims of the death card that have kind of rallied together to travel the cosmos and destroy every incarnation of the deck of many things really really cool a lot of very interesting dynamics that you could add to your campaigns based on these factions and then probably my favorite element of the entire book and my favorite element of the set as a whole is the divination aspect so the star chapter is incredibly juicy for world building prospects it has a whole section on building out prophecies and relating them to your character's backstories there's an entire element of astronomy where it talks about drawing cards to determine someone's astrological sign and how that connects to when in the year they were born and the alignment of the stars there's a real focus throughout the book on relating the cards to individual characters so you get several kind of sidebars that say if you've got a character of this kind of archetype like a fighty character here are some cards that you might draw and here's a big table of some background juice for building out these characters and all of that stuff is really excellent and i love the idea of during a session zero doing card readings to help kind of mythologize the player's backstories especially for kind of an epic heroic high fantasy game something like a heavily inspired greek pantheon game like a theros campaign where myth and legend and portent is really important a lot of the advice in this book is going to make your job as the game master both a lot easier and i think is going to make your portents much more powerful which brings us on to the other two elements of the deck of many things box set this so far we've been just talking about the books but there's three elements to this there is the main book of many things that are the deck of many things cards which come as the principal deck of many things the major arcana those 22 cards or whatever it is and then the deck of many more things which is i think 44 extra cards which cover all of the extra cards included in the book but then there is a card reference guide which goes over each card included in the set and gives you guidance on how to use them to both build adventures but also to use them in kind of divination and tarot based settings and i used this in my campaign last week and it is really really good so each one of the cards has kind of short synopses for what that card could mean if it is in relation to a person a place a treasure a situation and then there's one other thing i think but i can't remember what it is let's actually look together so let's have a look inside the deck of many things card reference guide first that the book itself is gorgeous the art direction for this book and the graphic design just a a star so if we pull through a regular a random page we get the beholder all right so each card gives us meanings for person creature or trap place treasure and situation and you get a version for if the card is upright and a version for if the card is reversed each one is only sort of a sentence long so the one for beholder let's say you pull a reversed beholder during a reading and you are pulling it in reference to a person so this would be a person perhaps a druid dedicated to preserving nature against corrupting influences and that's all you get 
but having used this specific book in my session last week holy moly it's real good <laughs> so i did a tarot reading for my players in this session last week and they came to a fortune teller this fortune teller had the deck of many things and we'll talk about the why that's important in a little bit but they did a basic read and a three card draw for several of the players and the way that they did this was that we sat down and the fortune teller said to the players i'm going to ask you some questions and we're going to work out your future together because they all wanted to know about their future specifically except for one who wanted to talk about their past so they didn't all want to know about their future one wanted to know about their past but that's fine so i did three cards and before each pull i asked them what focus they wanted to do person place treasure situation creature or trap i omitted creature and trap because that immediately seemed like a gamey element to me whereas the other four seemed like a, a natural thing for a fortune teller to ask a person do you want to know about this thing in your future so the players gave their they'd say i want to know about a person they'd draw a card see what the card was i'd read this rules re read the rules reference the the card reference book and tie that into the player and the campaign and what was coming up. And it just, it worked so well. I cannot tell you how impressed I was with that whole process. It added a lot of drama to the scene. I didn't feel like I was having to make anything up because I got guidance from the reference guide. I was pulling cards physically at the table. It was real atmospheric and then... I would be able to give them a proper tarot reading. Several of the players got really spookily accurate readings based on things that I'd already planned to come up in the campaign anyway, which was kind of, I'm not, I'm, I am not a spiritual person. I am not a believer, but it, it, it shooketh me. And I was like, who? Even, even I had to pause and be like, that's, that's uncanny. Then the cards themselves are just, just gorgeous it's now that they have been adjusted and um a mess which i believe is how a lot of them appeared in the initial printing all warped and poorly cut and things and just just generally a bad time for a company that makes so much money making cards but now that they've kind of gone back and redone that which is the right move i'm glad they did it i glad i'm glad they delayed it to do that it shouldn't have happened in the first place but i'm glad they fixed it the cards are gorgeous it's they're gorgeous to the point where i almost don't want to use them um i actually have a, a secondary set of tarot cards of deck of many things themed cards that my girlfriend gave me because we've been wait i've been waiting for this book for so long it seemed like it was never going to come and she knew i was waiting for it so she gave me a secondary deck and that's the one that i have been using as my 22 deck of specific deck of many things and then i will use this set from the box set as my deck of many more things because one thing that came up in the book i don't know if this was part of the history of the deck before but this idea that if you take a card out of the deck of many things eventually a new deck can grow from it love that idea really really love that idea and immediately wanted to implement it in my game so when my players interacted with that fortune teller one of them passed an arcana check to know that these were that they were being read from from a deck of many things and they had an interaction and they were able to buy a singular card from the deck of many things which i have put into a sealed envelope i don't know what card they have drawn and then each time a week or a month or however long passes and the single card propagates a new card and starts building that deck i'll shuffle the remaining cards pick one of them put it into that envelope and they'll slowly start building this expanding set of a deck of many things that none of us know what's in there and i think the drama and the tension from that is going to be excellent so overall i am really pretty impressed with the content of the book of many things as well as the deck of many things box i was really skeptical specifically about this reference guide i knew the cards would be gorgeous because you know they hire really talented artists so i knew the cards would be gorgeous but i was really skeptical about this book and for me it's the it's the dark horse of the set and i don't think that you get it on D, D beyond which is a real shame because this is one of the most useful parts of the whole book to be able to lay out those tarot cards 
and get meaning from them and there's a whole little section in here that tells you how to build adventures using a deck of many things or a tarot deck to build situations build five room dungeons all that kind of thing really useful this is the element of the book that i think i will use the most versus the actual book itself but the book itself is filled with great content for the most part just really poorly laid out seriously wizards if you're watching this and i know you religiously watch every single one of my videos every single employee of wizards of the coast it's mandatory viewing at wizards hq sort your layout out just remember that these are reference books for people playing a game and that referencing the material in them is kind of important to us and you're just going to make some, such bad products. So I'd love to know what you think of the deck of many things down below. But more importantly, if you've used the deck in your games, I want to hear the story about how it elevated your heroes to new powers or completely ruined their lives. Speaking of ruining their own lives, if you want to carry on watching, check out this video where I talk about the time my players inadvertently blew up the country they were trying to save. But until next time, happy gaming.